Okay, welcome to today's class, everybody. It's nice to see you all and good representation for each team. Through the agenda for today, um, <clears throat> first. So in about five minutes or so, we are going to teleport to the Virtual Ability Island Amphitheater, where we will meet Gentle Heron, who founded this community um, many, many years ago. It's one of the longest established communities in Second Life, um, and we always have a very interesting field, tip, field trip to meet with them. Gentle is very experienced, very knowledgeable, and very happy to share her experiences um, and those of the, the community. Um, okay. So everybody, um, we're here in Virtual Ability Island, and I'd like to introduce our host, Gentle Heron, who founded this community many years ago. Um, she is a retired professor and academic, uh, based in the US and has very graciously um, invited this class here every year since we began the module. Um, she's going to tell us, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit about how this community was founded, how it came about and how it's sustained. So please welcome Gentle Heron. Thank and you. Over to you, Gentle. Thank you. So I want to welcome everybody, students and professors. I'm really glad that you could visit Virtual Ability today. I want to be sure that everybody can hear me adequately and see the text chat that's coming out. And that you can see the slides that are behind me on the front of the auditorium. I'm going to present today in both voice and text. We do that for accessibility reasons. So is everyone OK so far? Everybody can see and hear. Thank you, Syrian. Thank you, John. Magua. Chantal. Interstar. Leah. Thank you. If you have trouble, talk to your professor. Talk to Sidearm. So I am Jettle Heron. As John said, I'm the founder of the Virtual Ability Community here in Second Life. I used to be an educational researcher, and then I got multiple sclerosis, and I had to medically retire. I'm going to share with you today four pieces of generic information that are going to give you some context. And then I'm going to introduce our guests and ask them a few questions, and you will have a chance to ask them questions too. So let's begin. Who's the Virtual Ability Community? Well, we call ourselves VAI, Virtual Ability. We're an international cross-disability peer support community. We have over 1,300 members. We're international because the people in our community come from six continents. Cross-disability means that our members who have disabilities, they might have a physical disability, a mental disability, emotional or developmental disability, or a sensory disability. Some of our people are completely deaf or completely blind, and many of us have multiple disabilities. We offer peer support, as well as education, acceptance, and understanding. Our community assists people with all kinds of disabilities to enter and thrive in virtual worlds like Second Life and other virtual worlds like Kitely and WolfGrid. Although virtual ability offers various educational and entertainment activities every day, we strongly encourage our members to explore everything in Second Life. And you're only going to find our members on our islands for our events. Most of the time, they're somewhere else in Second Life. 
Many of us act as peer mentors or role models for other people. We're not acting as professionals, even those of us who are professionals in the physical world. Sometimes it's important to communicate with people who are most like yourself. Those are people who will get your concerns, your language, and your point of view. And that's why most people with disabilities seek to relate, at least some of the time, with other people like ourselves. But we don't want to live in isolation from other people who do not share our disabilities. We are not a virtual leper colony. About a quarter of our members do not, at least not yet, have disabilities. We call them TABs, temporarily able-bodied. They might be a parent, a spouse, a child, or a friend of someone who does have a disability. Maybe they're a professional or non-professional caregiver, an academic researcher like your professors, a medical professional, a doctor or a nurse, or an educator. Our community has been in Second Life for almost 17 years, so we have a good record of continuity here. We are widely recognized for the quality of our service to our community. We won the first Linden Prize back in 2009 for a project that has a tangible impact on the real world. We're supported in virtual worlds by a U.S. nonprofit corporation, Virtual Ability Inc. And we're probably the first Second Life entity to be given legal physical world nonprofit status. What's the relationship between physical and virtual online communities? I actually reject the term RL for real life when it's used to distinguish the physical world from the virtual world. Some avatars may not be realistic. If by realistic you mean a replica of the individual sitting at the computer operating it, I certainly don't look like this in the physical world. But the avatars are realistic in terms of the person who created them. Our avatars express our personal sense of self. I have found that communities are quite similar in both venues. Why do I think that virtual ability is a real community? Some definitions of community are based on geographic proximity. That is not us. Nor are we culturally similar. In fact, we embrace diversity. The population of persons with disabilities is the largest minority group in the world. It's also the most varied minority group. In our virtual ability group chats, we often hear people say, oh, I didn't know people with that kind of disability had those symptoms too, just like I do with this different kind of disability. Or they might say, wow, we have the same diagnosis, but your life is very different from mine. Our diversity is a constant for all of our community interactions and it requires a group value of respect and accommodation. Both respect and accommodation are necessary for effective collaboration. So we aren't together physically and we aren't really very similar. However, we definitely exhibit some other aspects of community. Our members form both close and informal relationships. We promote mutual support among our members. In fact, we ask potential new members what the community can do for them and what they can do for the community. We share common values 
and beliefs. One important community value is our emphasis on ability, not on disability. We offer organized interactions and activities. Some of the most popular things we do are campfire chats and dances. Most of our members exhibit a strong sense of belonging to the community. So how are virtual communities developed and maintained? I would have to say the development process is an organic, biological-like process of accretion and evolution. Can you tell I was originally trained as a biologist? We have a niche within the larger Second Life ecosystem, and we specialize to fill that niche. We are maintained through the continued interest and volunteer time of many, many wonderful community members. And you will get a chance to meet a few of our friends during the Q&A session. As a community, we interact with other communities and individuals, of course. On our public health info island, which is directly to our west, we focus not on disabilities and impairments, but rather on health and wellness. You will find educational exhibits and displays, a pavilion listing research opportunities you might participate in, and you'll find the path of support pictured on the slide. The path of support lists information about the more than 120, 120 disability peer support communities that we have identified here in Second Life. There's a list of the current month's exhibits and displays on Health Info Island on a note card that's in the blue poster to the left of the stage as you're looking at it. Just click on that blue poster and you'll get a folder with some note cards in it. Another note card in the poster tells more about the Second Life Islands that our community maintains. Our community has three residential islands with private properties around the edges and public land in the center. On Cape Abel, there's an art gallery on the public land, and it shows art that's created by persons with disabilities. Cape Serenity has a library, and in the library are books, articles, stories, and poetry by virtual ability authors and other people's much more famous, but you may not know that they have or had a disability. Offering only works created by persons with disabilities goes along with our emphasis on the abilities of people with disabilities. And you're welcome to visit our public areas anytime. Oh. I am a member of the educator community here in Second Life. I'm interested in education because I used to be an education researcher. And before that, I used to be a teacher. But now that I'm retired, I'm working informally in education. And our virtual ability community actually does offer health and wellness information in several different formats. And this class, of course, is one. I really enjoy talking with students because you guys are the future of the world. We also do sessions, educational sessions for other Second Life communities. I mentioned Health Info Island before. I do hope you will take the opportunity to check out the poster sets over there. They are an asynchronous 
meaning you can learn anytime, type of informal education. We have new posters up there every month. This month, one of the posters I am most proud of, one of the poster sets, it has 20 posters in it, is about climate change, obesity, and undernutrition. You may never have thought of those as being part of climate change. And after our session today, you can teleport over there to that slurl. And actually, I've found that physical world and Second Life communities are very similar. And it may even be that at least for informal education, it's easier to do it in a virtual setting. So I'm going to ask that same question to our three panelists. You are all members of the large, diverse community of educators in Second Life. It is a very large community, probably one of the largest. And you are also members, I know, of at least one professional educator community in the physical world. What are the similarities and differences you've noticed between the two communities? Uh, who would like to go first, John? Yep, I'm happy to go first. So uh, for starters, I think what has surprised me over my time in Second Life um, is how similar communities can be in here in virtual worlds um, with the natural world. So many of the same um, attributes of communities are evident. So I suppose the first thing is that it is surprisingly easy on one level to join a new community here and to meet new people and get to know them. So for instance, I've never met Gentle Heron in the natural world, but we've been working together now since I came in here to start teaching, which is about 2008 or 2009. And in that time, we've gotten to know each other as professionals. Um, and a lot of the same attributes to how that relationship works, um, work here as they do in the real world. So we communicate, we arrange, for instance, in arranging this meeting, we've had some email communication in advance to arrange the time and the date that suited Gentle. <clears throat> We make sure that we communicate offline so that we all understand exactly what we're committing to, what's expected of us, and what we expect from our colleagues. Um, but in many ways, it's easier to join a group in a virtual world because one of the key differences between being here and being in the natural world is that you, you can almost talk to anybody you meet here. So unlike being in the natural world where you can't really walk up to a stranger in the street and start a conversation. Well, you can, but you might get an odd reaction. And it's certainly not considered appropriate. <clears throat> there is an acceptance of that here in the virtual world. And I've often thought that is probably because we all join this virtual world probably to meet others is the first and foremost reason. And so there's a kind of natural understanding that you will talk to people that you haven't met before. So that makes meeting new people and meeting people who are in different communities a little bit easier. The protocols here and the conventions of communication are a little different, however. So you'll have noticed in class that we frequently ask you to respond with a Y or an N to ensure that you're still hearing what we're saying and how we're, that we are in fact communicating. Um, so that feedback is a little bit more important in the virtual world where we can't see you in your physical bodies. And a lot of the 
expressions, the nonverbal expressions that we use to ensure that people are still listening to us, they haven't fallen asleep or wandered away. Um, those aren't available to us here in the virtual world, so we have to make those up separately. Um, maintaining contact with the community is quite similar here as in the natural world. So you can't simply use people when you want them and then expect them to be waiting around for you at a later stage. You have to nurture and develop relationships in a very similar way. John, your voice is cut out. Chantal, your mic is on. Magra, would you like to? Yeah, answer? I'll st step up here and then while John is fixing his mic and yeah. then I can, I can he's, contribute. He's fixing his voice. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he mentioned, John mentioned most of the things uh, related with our uh, experience in the second life. Um, in the virtual communities here that I have spent a lot of time here as well, as well as John did. And we have been in touch with the Virtual Ability Island, Whole Brain Health, and other communities as well before. And we have done a lot of activities together uh, in partnership with those different communities. And I'm also a member of the education community here in Second Life. And one thing that I would add, what John has mentioned, is um, how time flies here, like the, the the aspect of time when you spend some time with some people here in Second Life, it's kind of, it feels longer than it is what you're spending here. You make more connection in shorter time or more intense connection in shorter time, uh, I believe. And uh, it, it's kind of, the, the time element is different in my own experience. That is what I feel, at least. I don't know, I, I haven't uh, seen any studies about that yet or uh, about this topic, honestly. But then in shorter time, we make more intense uh, relationships here. And we have done more uh, that I would do with, with a real life colleague, maybe. The reason that is maybe we are totally focused here when we are here. Uh, we are doing a session, we are doing an event, or we are organizing something, and we are totally focused here when we are here. And uh, we don't have many distractions, maybe. I don't know. There, there could be different reasons. But then that is one aspect that I would say as a difference from the real, real world uh, experience when we work in communities. And the other one is how we build our international uh, relations here in terms of university, Chai University. Uh, we have been in contact with many international people here uh, and in terms of students, international students, international uh, faculty members, uh, experts from different countries and areas. So they all contributed our courses in many ways and that was really really um, colorful for us i mean it, it made it very rich what we are doing here and that is why i i basically stay in second life and didn't migrate to any other platform because i believe the community here what makes it worth to spend time so those are the two things that i would say uh, pretty much uh, different than what we're doing in real world uh, as a member of a, a education community. And um, to become international, we don't 
cover the logistics costs. It's less costly and less time uh, we need. Uh, we could have here, like you could see, Gentle from USA, John from Ireland, me from Turkey. We could sit down and talk to each other. And you guys are all over the world, maybe. Uh, there are other people uh, from other cities and other uh, countries here with us. So we are just uh, together uh, with less cost and uh, we could do something together. So okay. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you. John, did you get your voice fixed? Yes, I think I'm back with you again. Okay, and Sirium is asking a good question. Why do you think it's better than the video conference calls? And actually, Sirium, we're going to get to that question. So if you don't mind, we'll let John finish what he had to say, and then we'll go to Sidearm for the first question. John? Okay, I think um, Magua actually referenced much of what I was going to say. So rather than boring everybody by repeating it, I'm going to say ditto and hand back to you, Jetla. Oh, okay. Sidearm? Thank you, Gentle. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to say something very obvious about the uh, virtual communities. You can reach more people online. And I was struck by your comment, Gentle, that you don't like calling it the real world. I have taken to calling it the offline world. So we have an online world such as we're in now and we have an offline world such as when i talk to my neighbor about getting estimates to repair the fence that just got blown down by a tornado last week you don't have to type all that gentle i started becoming interested in the online world while i still worked for a large corporation i in fact it was so long ago. It was so long ago we didn't even have email. Children, gather round, you students. No, literally, we did not have email. So we got email in the corporation, and I picked an outside email address <laughs> called Sidearm. So I started my online identity while I still worked in the real world. You can reach more people online. That was point number one. When I got into Second Life and began doing projects, in the virtual world, you can explore your wilder interests. one story put wilder it's your wild interests i met an environmental engineer in second life see i'm a systems engineer so i said oh you're an environmental engineer how cool guess what they started doing they started learning how to design hair and started selling hair I myself learned how to book live music and DJs for an Irish bar in Second Life. So you can explore your wilder interests here. The third point I want to make is that in order for this to work, you have to use multiple platforms. Second Life is a 3D metaverse. But I connect to people not only with email, but with WhatsApp, like you guys, Instagram, Google Docs, Skype, WordPress, you don't have to type all that, multiple apps. I have to meet where the people are because that is my goal, is to connect to as many 
of 8 billion people in the world as I can. And the last point is sometimes when you meet someone in the real world that you only met in the virtual world, it can be a shock. Or you meet them in the virtual world after the real world. I met John O'Connor in the real world first in Ireland. I have never met Magua. I've never met Marino, who's sitting over there in the corner studying for her exams. I've never met Ginger. Uh, I met Ham Rambler, who started the Irish bar. Um, so they look different. I mean, that's a silly thing to say. But if you look at a person in the real world, and you remember having met them in the virtual world, you realize they have a, a wild side and you appreciate them more. And by wild, I mean beyond the obvious. I look at Explorer in the back wearing a hulking beast man avatar. I said, wow, that's kind of shocking to see him He's majoring in international trade and logistics, but his wild side here in Second Life is a wild beast man. Or I look at Gizem, who is working on a PhD in business, and she's wearing a beautiful uh, princess outfit, is what I'd call it. So these are our wild sides, and they we are more fully expressed as human beings by having the virtual online world available. <coughs> Over. Thank you very much to all of you. Now let's look at the second question. And I think this may answer the question that was asked before. What are the advantages, both professionally and personally, of being part of a virtual community. And my answer is, for me, the advantage is accessibility. I can sit in my wheelchair and be with other people from all over the world. And actually, I'm just sitting in front of my computer in my bedroom. And it's a real joy to me to be able to work with so many international colleagues without the fuss and the bother of having to travel although that might be fun. Uh, which one of you three would like to start on that one? I'm happy to go again. Okay, John. Thank you, Gentle. Um, so the advantages um, on both levels initially, I suppose, are, as you mentioned, um, Gentle, the ease of travel. So. We can just zoom in here or jump in here immediately and meet with a lot of international colleagues without having the trouble of and the difficulty of having to travel much and all as I enjoy traveling in the natural world. Um, it means we can get a lot more done a lot more quickly. So I have attended conferences here in second life that I might not have been able to travel to physically. Um, I can present at many more conferences and seminars and international meetings because of the fact that it just takes the time of the actual presentation to deliver. I don't have to factor in traveling too far. The virtual world opens up a huge diverse populace to meet with and to work with. So one of the main professional reasons that I started teaching in Second Life was because it offered the opportunity to bring many more people in to meet with my students than would have otherwise been the case. 
So we were able to have the advantage of people from several different continents come along and meet with our students, just as we're doing so today, and gain so much more experience in terms of intercultural engagement as we learn how different cultures and people from different cultures react differently and have different views. Um, we deal with different, <clears throat> excuse me, with different languages, which also brings an added interest to our learning. We deal um, with people who have different celebrations and festivals and we learn to address that. We deal with people from different time zones. So we have to learn how to adjust what we do when we're meeting people, maybe adjust how we approach things. Um, the advantage of having this engagement means you get a much broader set of circumstances to influence your response to any given situation. So when you're working on a project, you have the advantage of all the different experiences that the different people from around the world are bringing to bear. On a personal level, you make friends with people that you might otherwise not have the opportunity to meet. And that doesn't just mean people from different countries, but for instance, maybe it's people who, like members of this community, are housebound and can't leave their homes. And so if we weren't meeting them here in Second Life, we might not have the opportunity to meet with them at all. And one of the nice things about meeting people here is you don't tend to bring the same sense of judgment that we might do when we meet people in the natural world. Because people are presenting themselves in a, in a way that they want to be seen. And so, because we all know that, we tend to reserve our judgment until we've, we actually get to know people a little bit more. So that's it for the moment. Thank you. Okay. Margaret, sure. do you have something to add? Yeah, yeah. Um, I did many things that John said, and it's uh, all uh, the advantages that he, he mentioned, we, I, I see his advantages as well. Uh, but additionally, um, also connecting what Syrian asked before, what is the difference of here or a video conference? Uh, you could do things here and you could feel things here differently than a video conference or a Zoom session or the same thing for a real life uh, or real world uh, offline session uh, in a class. And one thing is, um, for me, it gives me the pleasure to do a course here because just because it's unique, it's something different than the other courses I have taken as a student or I have taught before. So that gives me pleasure in, in a way that satisfies me to do that or try it, you know, try to see that it could contribute in different ways to the learning or the teaching experience here. So uh, that is one thing, just, just to be different from the regular or the whatever we call normal in teaching and uh, learning. And the other thing is, I see here is a filter. Second Life is a filter. It, it kind of narrows down the community for me to reach out uh, in a way that same-minded people are using here or let's say open-minded people or people who are not afraid of trying new things are here and sticking around for many years so we always mention i always mention that um when, when i when in different conferences or speeches we are we are the fishes uh, swimming in the same pond that's why we meet here, and maybe that's why we connect better, in a way, because we already 
uh, eliminated certain differences by coming here. So that is uh, another thing. The, um, the third one I would say, why is it feeling different here than real life and in a better way is, uh, one of my students mentioned that to me. He, he said like it was hard for him to come to my office in real life and talk to me as a professor. But here it was much easier for him to connect with me, to talk to me. So maybe that is also uh, the psychological effect of the communication here or uh, the, the way that we uh, share things here. So that is another advantage I would add to the list, probably. Thank you. Thank you, Magra. <clears throat> We're going to skip sidearm because he's saying ditto, ditto, ditto. And Syriam, I'd like to ask that question after I ask the next question that we've prepared for, because I think this may be of interest to you. I like your questions. They're very good questions. So the third question that I was going to ask is, what are the disadvantages of being part of a virtual community? And I'm going to be very honest with you now. I miss hugs. Physical contact is something we all need from time to time. But they haven't figured out how to do that in Second Life. John, do you have some input on what uh, some disadvantages are of this menu? Yes. Um, I think you're right. The hugs, the smells, the tastes, um, the wind, the atmosphere, climate, weather are things we would miss. Um, what I miss most of all are expressions. So being able to tell what somebody is feeling just by seeing how they sit or what expression they have on their face. Um, or how they're moving their hands or perhaps not moving their hands or how they're fidgeting or walking around or walking up and down. So the, the lack of <clears throat> an avatar that actually reflects our physicality in the natural world is one of the disadvantages here. Over. I, I think that's very right. I will add time zones and um, the uh, in different hours, different events taking places here. Uh, and since we are a huge uh, international community, sometimes uh, it's hard to uh, catch up here while you are, um, you have to do some other things in real life and so on. Right, right now, for example, I, I had to pick up my kids from school, but instead uh, I asked a friend to pick them up and bring them to where I'm working uh, so that we will, we will I mean, this, the kids will leave a little later than uh, which is expected from school to home today. So th those are the things that we have to deal with uh, around what we're doing today. That's a very good point. I had to change my medication schedule to be here today at this time. Uh, Sidar, would you want to answer that one? Sure, sure. Um, the, um, the main advantage is being able to reach people I would never be able to reach in in the natural world or the offline world. The major disadvantage is trying to read people's minds, so to speak, at, a, at an extreme disconnect. Um, uh, it, the online world, we have sight, sound, text. There's a lot of rich communication in hearing your voice like gentle your voice is so rich in the timbre um, students i and 
I'm not frustrated, but I just wish you would use your voice more. Um, even if it's hard for me to understand you, uh, there's a, there's, there's more coming across in hearing your voice than simply typing in text. But those are the limits of online. Um, that doesn't mean the natural world is perfect. I have my son and my wife. I have the neighbors. I have to read their minds too, trying to understand where they're coming from. And it doesn't help that I could, you know, smell them or taste them, so to speak, or touch them. I mean, touch does help. Gentle makes a good point about hugs. Um, I think as human beings, we communicate on multiple channels. And at least for me personally, um, the more people I can meet and work with, even if it is online, the more I grow. I especially appreciate working with undergraduates and postgraduates. I would not be working with you where I live uh, without driving 90 minutes both ways to the local universities and colleges. Uh, so for me, it's worth the disadvantage uh, because of the advantage. Over. Sorry, I have to type just a little bit. And what I'd like to do now, if it's okay with my guests, is to change. Just, John, just go a ahead. moment. I, I just spoke about the disadvantage. I didn't really address the, the advantages. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go on for long because mostly they've been said by, by Magua and Sightarm. But the one I would add is there is um second life in particular but it does stretch across other virtual worlds are notable for their overall sense of community which is based around um volunteerism so there is access in this virtual world to people who engage in various activities for the sheer enjoyment of engaging so there is a there is a massive resource in a virtual world like second life which is available to tap into um, and is available for us to contribute to as well uh, at a level that you don't often see in the real world and at a consistency and an intensity that you don't often see in the natural world so I would I just add that. Thank you. Oh, that's really good. Uh, what I'd like to do is to skip the fourth question we had set up, and I'd like to ask Sirium's questions because they're so good. So what about people who might not take virtual worlds seriously? I mean, they're, they're virtual. They're not real. And people ask questions like, why should I even bother to be in a virtual world? What's the purpose of all of this? Isn't this just a video game? Are we trying to hide from real world situations? And Sidearm, if you wouldn't mind typing for me, I'd like to respond to the last of Sirium's questions. Because in the disability community, we get asked that question all the time. Do you come into virtual worlds to escape your physical condition? Are you hiding from your disability in here? You notice my avatar does not have a wheelchair. And so I need to answer that question often. And the answer is no. This world is not separate from the physical world. This world is an extension of the physical world. This world is as much a part of my life as my physical existence. 
I don't deny my disability. It does impact my life. But my relationships here in the physical world, in the, in the virtual world, enhance my physical world life so much that I have come to need to be in Second Life. I need to have these friendships. They're very important to me. So no, I'm not escaping my real world. It's with me always, but so is the, the, the virtual environment. Thank you, Sidearm. Would uh, one of our three other panelists like to address some of Sirium's questions? They're very good questions. Yes. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, a couple of things to say. So firstly, um, David Chalmers, the professor of philosophy um, it, at NYU, New York University, wrote a book in 2022 called Reality Plus. And he quite clearly states that virtual reality is real. And people live, we can live in virtual reality as full and as experienced a life as we can in the natural world. Now that's the first time a philosopher has really addressed that point um, in such a head-on manner. That's interesting and it's worth considering and it's, his book is worth reading. Noel Fitzpatrick, who's Professor of Philosophy with us in TU Dublin, <clears throat> and who has done much work over the years with Bernard Stiegler, the French activist philosopher, believes that for human beings, technology and our tools are our, our way of intervening in our environment. And he would go so far, I think, as to refer to us as homo technologicus, so it is actually our tools that make us human and, and give us our humanity. Um, and this tool of a virtual environment allows us to explore not just our virtual engagements, but our real engagements. And as Gentle has said, there is no separation between the virtual and the real. It's an extension. Um, the, um, I had another thought to add to that, but it's escaped me, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, rather than trying to grasp that, I'm going to stop and allow somebody else to come in. And if it comes back to me, I'll bring it to you if it's worth it. Okay, that sounds fine. Magua? Um, I did know many of the things that uh, you guys said about uh, the questions uh, of Sirium, but then um, if I need to um, add anything to that, like, yes, many people, I mean, I've seen these, those reactions from the people when I was teaching here, for example, and we had uh, some other professors were checking what we were doing, and then uh, they they were saying, sometimes you see that they're not taking it too seriously what we're doing here because it's kind of cartoonish or whatever animation based it looks. But at the same time, uh, when, when you see the results, like what we're doing together uh, with international colleagues here and the feedback from the students, uh, and many of them were very positive about it uh, so far, uh, which which counts for me as well, like it's a proof that it is teaching them something. It is making them learn something out of all this thing. And uh, another uh, thing is here, we, the students, we encourage them with the projects that they do some uh, 3D immersive uh, expression here and they create things they, that they wouldn't be able to uh, create in, in a normal class 
session, for example, it will be maybe a PowerPoint slide of presentation, what I would do, but here they could do more interactive stuff. And they have done amazing builds, amazing settings in years uh, I have seen done by the students here. So those are the plus things. Over. That's a, that's a good point. Sidearm, did you want to add to this? Yeah, I'm trying to uh, scroll back. I guess the question is, why should we be here? What is the purpose? Is this a video game? Are we trying? Okay. So, hmm. I mean, I I spent a lot of time. Uh, I spent a lot of time on Twitch. For those that know about. Twitch, which is a streaming channel, which is theoretically for gamers, but it has a huge, its most popular category is music, streaming music, live music created on the spot or per request. Um, then I spent time on YouTube streaming and learning on YouTube. Uh, when I first started to learn about online, I went into Wikipedia. I became a Wikipedia editor. Um, if you want to talk about communities of interest in the world, just try to edit a Wikipedia article and see what happens. Or uh, if you want to share your work, post on YouTube or stream on Twitch. Those are multinational online channels. When I think about what is the advantage to being online second life is like low on my list Sirium, because there are millions and billions of people already online every day and people i think don't understand that yet they artificially put a wall between being in a 3D metaverse and being watching the latest uh, Irish rugby, rugby, whatever that's called, uh, on TV or on on the internet or whatever. We're already in the metaverse. The students here already know what we're talking about. They know Instagram better than I do, for sure. And so the ones that come here in Second Life don't have to be convinced about the value of having online connections and online friends and online professional opportunities. They already do that. They already live that. The real question is, should we bother doing it in 3D? Okay, that was a big preface. So I've spent mm, 15 years in Second Life loving it at the beginning, you know, the Irish bar. But I noticed that the people that have been here that long sort of, this is me talking, gentle. They seem, some of them seem cranky. Why don't they appreciate Second Life more? Uh, you know, <laughs> because they run into what Sirium said. It looks like a cartoon world. Why should I bother? But I would say, when she's not studying for exams, go interview Marino or go interview uh, Ovsel uh, or interview Tall Ninja. A couple of you have taken to building, you know, like ducks to water. Something is hooking your interest. Um, and my theory is that it's learning to build here, but that's my theory. Um, Sirium. You've taken to building like a duck to water. We should be interviewing you about why you're spending so much time lately studying all this. Um, and then more to the point, will you still be here a year from now? You know, a longitudinal study. Yeah, I'm so sorry, uh, gentle, but I warned you earlier that I would be kind of expostulating here. So to me, it's all about us human beings expressing ourselves in multimedia, an online, 
Ditto channel. It is an extension of our physical world. The it doesn't surpass it. It includes it. The the online world is more physical than you have any idea. If you would look at the server rooms and the electronics and the heat that's being generated, the people that are worried about global warming are starting to count the heat produced by all of our computers. It's very physical. This is a physical world and the digital world is physical also. Enough. Over. Let's look um, at a practical example. Sorry, Michael, do you want to go ahead? Um, I want to add something here, if if I may. Um, the um, one one thing happened like uh, yesterday. I found a series, and the uh, combining the two worlds, uh, like the physical world and the uh, the three D world that we are having here. I that was a series of computer games called Fallout, and uh, this Fallout is like they have the Fallout one, two, three, four, like series of a computer game, and it was a huge role-playing game uh, that uh, we enjoyed a lot when we were young. And uh, um, yesterday, I watched. The series that they came out lately on Amazon uh, Amazon uh, channel, and uh, that they made the they took the whole uh, 3D computer game and put it into a series TV series, and how they reflected everything in the computer game, all those details, the characters, it's amazing. Like uh, they kind of copied it very nicely into a TV show, and it it kind of brings you to um, another dimension of reality, kind of. So maybe to see the same thing in different perspectives, in different shapes, also triggers certain feelings. And it's, it's, I mean, I felt that this series was much more successful or much more enjoyable than any series that I would watch from scratch, because I knew that that was, you know, the, the familiar, it's familiarizing ourselves with the content through the 3D first, and then I've seen the real thing in, in the TV show, like a more realistic thing. So that is that, that affected me. I don't know. It's, uh, there, there should be a uh, maybe, maybe that could be used in terms of education in the future as well, or that kind of reality. I was going to um, <clears throat> point out two practical examples of where the virtual and the natural worlds collide. Um, Syria asked, where they, where do they come together? So the first one is in academic papers that I have written with colleagues here that have been published. Um, the more recent and upcoming one is the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium, which hosts the Eduverse, the educational space here, um, has now come together with Cha University, who are going to host a conference in the physical world in September, at which some of us will attend physically and some of us will attend through Second Life. And that's a very real example of those two worlds and those two communities coming together in a way that would never have happened if we didn't have Second Life to meet in originally. Thank you. I think that's answering Sirium's Next set of questions. Sir, I'm going to let you be the moderator of the next um, panel. <laughs> how do you connect the different communities and how do you link back to the real world communities? What are the challenges? This can go both ways. Uh, Sidearm, do you mind transcribing again? The connection can go both ways. 
For instance, the American Cancer Society has always run fundraising in the physical world. Now they also have Relay for Life in Second Life, and it is one of their biggest fundraisers. They approached Second Life as an additional opportunity. But the relationship goes the other way as well, that sometimes we have impacts on the physical world. So for instance, I'm working with a researcher from California who is looking at the impact of technology on climate change. And as Sidar mentioned, our computers put out heat. They are contributing to climate change. So we're going to be researching this and that is initiated in the virtual worlds and it's being presented actually this next week to the National Science Foundation in the physical world. So that sort of relationship can go in both directions. It can go from the physical world into the virtual and it can also go from the virtual back into the physical world. Does anybody else want to address Sirium's questions about challenges of connecting communities? Yes, Sirium. Just to say, I would just say that the challenges are actually quite similar. Um, so maintaining contact with a community when you're busy, with all the things that go on in your life um, is not easy, either in the physical world or in the virtual world. So it requires effort. It requires commitment. It requires um, consistency and reliability, just as it does in the real world. So in, in many, many ways, being part of a community in a virtual world is not all that different from being part of a community in the physical world. Over. Margaret, do you want to add to that? The, the opportunities of networking here, like for example, uh, I made John, through John I made Sai, and then through uh, John also I made Lucia, which I'm also doing real life stuff with Lucia. So it's like we, we mentioned in the course before, and we are talking about it uh, among ourselves when uh, Sai is uh, lecturing about it, uh, the metaverse and other things. Uh, he, he says six degrees of separation. There are a lot of people who hear about us, what we do, and they contact us. So it's kind of helping in a way to connect each other. Uh, through this world, and it also extends to the real real world. Uh, I've been on a radio program on a local U.S. radio. I think, I'm not sure, I, I forgot, it was years ago, but it was either, uh, you know, some state on up north, uh, Idaho, or what was it, U Utah? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even really remember, but it was a local radio in USA, you know, how am I going to be on a radio, local radio in USA on a live show? Because someone met me here and he invited me that we were doing a student project for a fundraising uh, for Kenyan students here in Second Life, an organization who works with the Kenya. So it was kind of a networking an opportunity that came up and they asked me if I would do that and I said, okay. So even some people in real life that I never met or will never meet probably in uh, USA somewhere, heard about what we were doing in class in Turkey. So that, that was uh, an extreme example of how we could connect with both worlds. Sidearm, do you want to add to that? We have just a few minutes before it's time for the students to Yes. get their task assignments <laughs> yes i want to um so everybody i came into second life to start a business and i did i came from working for a large corporation 
and I took the time to take courses in business and startups and entrepreneurship and sole proprietorship. So I liked working for a corporation, but I wanted to do something on my own. So I had to make money here. So somehow, years later, I stumbled into working with a bunch of academics, with all due respect, Magua and John, um, and even you, gentle to some point. I care about these students here, you students. <laughs> Some of you are going to be professors, but probably most of you are going to go get a job when you graduate and have a career. And I want you to have careers that match your interests. So for me, by exploring what I call your wild side through a 3D metaverse, helps you better identify your interests in the, in the real world where you get a real job. And all credit to uh, Magua for starting uh, the Meta Entrepreneurship course, which I recommend that you take next year for the third year students, because that is much more closely tied to, you know, the business side. Um, so I guess my point is the benefit of you being in a virtual environment is going to help you get a job, help you get a career somehow, some way, but it also helps you better identify what you really catches your interest and what you want to do in life. And you can have both. You can have, you know, in this in the United States, we call it a day job and a and a night job. Um, I talked to Marino about this a lot. I talked to because she's graduating, you know, and she's already out there. Uh, and she knows that I use her as an example. Um, so the third year students are going to be facing that in a year. And then the postgraduate students, I guess you've decided to go academic. So, but even then, you know, what about this is catching your interest that you go, yeah, my God, I love the academic world. And now I could do some whole new kind of research here led by our fearless leader, Sirium, who's become a building uh, maniac, so to speak. So that's it. Over and out. Thank you, General, for this panel. Well, I think it's about time for student assignments. So I'm going to thank the students for joining us here today. I want to thank Dr. Sarat <laughs> Connor for inviting us to share about virtual ability and other communities with your classes. And now I'm going to turn it back. I think it's Magua that does the assignment. Um, firstly, can I thank Gentle Heron so much for hosting us here today uh, and sharing all the information about this community and then for chairing such an excellent discussion while also contributing to it. So as, you, as ever, Gentle, we really appreciate your hospitality and your generosity. And on behalf of all of us as staff and all the students, may I offer you a sincere thank you. <laughs>